Okay, go ahead and, well, first of all, this episode, I think, will be, it's, a lot of people, I asked a while back, like, you know, what do you guys want to hear about? And the answers I got were more guys <laughs> and um, <laughs> more, like, what, I mean, they said non-traditional applicants, but to be honest, I think a lot of people are non-traditional applicants. Um, so, I just want to hear your story, and I, I like, like I said, I just don't feel like there's a traditional necessarily I, applicant anymore but I, mean, I i will say i am really non-traditional like i came from a really came from a really rough home okay. and so to get here kind of was because of some other people like i you know every kid as a you know as a young person's like oh i want to be a doctor i want to you know and that was kind of one of those things that i toyed with but like it wasn't until I went back to college the second time that I was like, oh, I want to go into nursing. Well, then I started working with some PAs, and that's when I was like, no, I don't want to do nursing. I, I, want, to, I want to be a PA. Okay. Well, give <laughs> but, us an introduction. Kind of tell us who you are and a little bit about you, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, my name is Jason Patterson. Um, I am from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I have been working in the medical field now for about six and a half years at my hospital. Um, just recently finished my bachelor's degree in May of 2018 and basically decided that after my degree was when I was going to apply as opposed to in the middle of it because I just didn't feel like with my past scholastic GPA from the first time I went to college, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough to be a contending applicant. So I wanted to take some post back classes and I did. And, and it, I think it really helped as far as, you know, kind of pushing everything towards getting accepted. So. Okay. So as far as when you mentioned a little bit, but how did your decision come about as far as, you know, I want to pursue becoming a PA? So um, the first time I went to college, I'm 36, so I'm a little bit older than probably some applicants. Um, I went to college, I graduated in high, I graduated high school in 2000. I waited four years to go to college and I thought that I was ready. Um, I went to a major university here in Oklahoma um, and I spent about uh, a year and a half there and just kind of washed out. Um, my mom at the time was really sick and I was trying to drive from town to town and basically work in my hometown, make money to give her to help with care and everything while driving back and forth to classes and it just wasn't working out. Um, I ended up leaving college at Oklahoma State with a 1.6 GPA, which is very rough and very hard to come back from. Thank goodness I didn't take a That helped out. Wait, sorry, you broke up for a minute. You said you didn't take what? A ton of science courses. Okay. I had basically taken some entry level courses. so. Um, I came back home, um, and I felt really defeated. Um, I didn't, um, I didn't know what I was doing in college. Um, I think I came from a generation where your parents would tell you, you need to go to college, but they just really wouldn't give you that guidance. It was just kind of, you need college, you need college, but when you don't really have a reason to go, then you're just kind of spinning your wheels. And so I came back home and started working, um, waited till my mom, you know, got better, um, and just kind of got into a slump of working. And I spent about 10 years in the restaurant industry managing and just, um, not really doing much. And I wanted to go back to college, but I didn't really know what to do. And I happened to actually meet my wife at the restaurant that I was managing. And so um, she kind of pushed me to, to leave. She said, you, you have a lot of drive and you shouldn't, you know, just spend it here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had talked to her about leaving. Um, and when I did, you know, I had talked to her about her family. Um, her grandmother was a nurse, her mom is a nurse. 
she's now an ICU nurse. So they had a lot of experience in the medical field and I had a lot of questions. And so, um, and this was at the time we were dating, we weren't even married yet, but she was just like, I think you should do, I think you should do this. I, I think it would be worth it. And so, I mean, just on a whim, I quit a really good paying job and went to work at the hospital that I've worked at ever since I started back to school. And so, um, so fast forward to about 2014. So this is about 10 years after I left Oklahoma State. Um, I started back to school and I started back at a community college here in Tulsa to literally right the wrongs that I had done in, in school the first time. Um, I did happen to find, uh, you know, myself retaking courses, not really because I was wanting to be a PA just yet, but just because I thought it was really awful that I had failed, you know, when I say failed, I, I had gotten a bunch of C's and D's. I hadn't gotten any F's, but I had done so poorly in classes that shouldn't be that hard that I just decided I was going to retake them. And so essentially as I was back in school and um, found this hospital to work at, they had an in-house CNA program and they said, look, we'll train you. Um, we'll pay you actually, instead of you spending money to get your CNA, we'll pay you and it takes five weeks and then you'll have a position at the hospital. And so for about, I would say a year and a half, I fully thought I'm gonna go to nursing school after this. And then um, I started transitioning into the emergency department. And once I did that, um, I had met a bunch of PAs um, and worked alongside a lot of PAs. And it completely changed my outlook of patient care and kind of how easily accessible they were and how there was a lot more communication between a lot of the PAs, especially the surgical teams at the hospital. Um, the surgeons, you know, a lot of times would send you the physician assistant to round and having that interaction with, you know, family, especially after something like that is, I just felt like it was really something I wanted to pursue. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, I like, part of your story because I feel like there are a lot of people who have this thought like you said you know I want to do something in medicine I want to do something in healthcare maybe be a PA even a nurse whatever um but they feel kind of stuck and right. they feel like they so I mean I get emails all the time from people I work in a, a business job I'm a teacher I have this great paying job I'm very secure I have people to take care of um how can I become a PA and I think a big part of your story is it takes some sacrifice you know and kind of making those decisions to get out of your comfort zone and maybe something that um make some difficult decisions at the time to pursue something you want in the future what, I guess, would you say to those people who feel like that, who feel just kind of like, you know, I don't feel like I can leave my job, but this is what I really want. I mean, what was kind of going through your mind or what was, I know you said your wife helped you to kind of say, you know, you can do this. Yeah, I, <laughs> so that, you know, I had spoke a little bit earlier about like my home life and stuff and kind of um, encouragement and um, I grew up in a single parent household. My mom was around and, um, she had some addiction issues. Um, my father was not around at all because of that and spent a lot of time in prison. Um, and, uh, and so I didn't really have a lot of, um, you know, solid encouragement. My grandparents were really good about it. And my mom was too, when she could be, um, but, you know, when my wife started, or my girlfriend at the time, you know, uh, yeah. started trying to push me towards this, you know, it, it was, it felt good. But I, at the same time, I was like, if I leave this job, I will literally 
make half of what I'm making now and I don't know how I can survive on that. Um, and I remember the day I interviewed for, for the nurse tech spot, um, the, the interviewer asked me, she said, why do you think we should accept you? And it might have been a blunt you know, statement, but I said, I don't think anyone at my age is going to come into a situation like this making what I make now and leave that to make half if I wasn't fully committed to making a change. And, and I, could, I could tell that she knew what I was saying. And so, you know, to go from a salaried position to a $10 an hour hospital position, it was, it was hard. I had to sell my car. I had to do some things that were hard. And at the time, I, I knew I was going to start a new path, but I just didn't know exactly like it was going to lead to this. Mm -hmm. And now, you're reflecting back four years plus of the second time in college it's i you know i i almost never thought i would get here because it's just like you keep climbing semester after semester and it's hard you know you're taking all these classes and it just doesn't seem like it's going to end and then finally you are at the end and you're applying for school and you're you're just like wow i don't have any more classes to take it feels weird like to not take anything and and that be okay because <laughs> i'm like in that lull period right now where i'm like what should i be doing you know yeah but just waiting right just waiting exactly but it it was it was it was a hard it was a hard transition and you know once i had the notion that you know this was what i was going to do it felt a lot easier because i had a purpose and i knew why I was taking the courses and I knew why I had to get the grades I had to get because, you know, I had messed up. I literally, I forced myself to work about 40 to 60 hours a week while taking full class loads, including summer. Um, and the reason why is because I knew if I got into an interview situation later on, The only way I was going to be able to prove that I wasn't the same student that I was 10 years ago was to show someone this is how many hours I've worked while also maintaining these grades, which is exactly what a PA school is going to look for when it comes to the rigors of, you know, semester after semester of just constantly being busy, you know, shadowing and volunteering and working full time and taking full class load like that's a very hard thing to do. Full-time work is very hard to do, but I knew that because my GPA was so low, I had to do it. I didn't really have a choice. You know, if I had started out with a decent GPA, then maybe I wouldn't have to work as much or maybe I wouldn't need as many, you know, volunteer hours or shadowing hours, but I knew that every other aspect of my application had to be perfect to even have someone want to call me, so. That, and that's a good perspective um, instead of just trying to meet the minimums and scrape by. Um, so your GPA from undergrad initially was what? It was a 1.6. <laughs> okay. And then what was it by the time you applied? By the time I applied, um, it was a 3.29. Okay. Um, and that took multiple 4.0 semesters yeah. uh, to get there. Um, okay. And the reason why is just because when you're that low, I think I, I think I left with about 37 or 38 hours of a 1.6. So the other big thing, and I know you've probably had a bunch of emails about, you know, GPA and low GPA and things like that. Um, I knew that it was only going to get to a certain amount because right. once you pass the cusp of 75 hours, 85, 90, 100 hours, it even getting all A's incrementally makes a smaller and smaller dent. And mm -hmm. so if, and I wish I'd had someone tell me this, which is a lot of the reason why I reached out to you. And I know there's other people out there. It's like, I wish I'd had someone tell me, look, don't sweat it, get the best grades you can, but make the other portions of your application as stunning as they can be because you can't do any, I mean, like you can only do so much. The GPA will only go up so much, right. but 
your GRE score can change, your patient care hours can change, everything else, your shadowing, your volunteering, everything can change, but that GPA is hard to, to maneuver and it costs a lot of money too. I've spent a lot of money fixing my mistake. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, no, and, and you're right. I mean, I think there is a, mm, I think 3.0 is the magic number though, like, Mm -hmm. And I mean, yes, people get accepted with less than that, but that tends to be the threshold that gets interviews, honestly. So um, I had a yeah, I had a minor panic attack when I put everything into CASPA because it actually rounds down a little bit, mm -hmm. and it ended up being a three point oh nine, and I was very. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, 3.2 is already not great. I'm like, I yeah. need all of the tiny increments of points that I can get. And so I was very, very nervous that it wasn't going to work out. 3.0 is magic number. Um, what was your science GPA? Um, it literally was the same exact as my cumulative. Okay. okay, I wasn't sure how that factored in. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah. The same. So I was... I, I knew that because that was so low, like I said, uh, I, I had to make everything else good. I think my patient care hours ended up being about 12,000. Nice. Um, so um, I my volunteer hours, I think were about 120 or 30. And I don't believe I really added up, uh, like after I, you know, processed everything, I had kind of forgot other things that I had done. So. It, probably was a little more than even that. And with the shadowing, um, I think I was at about 120, something along the lines of that. Okay, cool. So as part of the application process, um, how did that go for you? I mean, what part was most difficult? Was there anything that you found helpful throughout that process? Um, I would say the most difficult situation is logging on that first day and just kind of trying to take it all in um i think the thing that um some students may not realize until they log in is how many steps there truly are to getting it complete mm -hmm. um especially with um if you've gone to multiple schools like i had uh, you have to show up to each school. Um, there's a printed off piece of paper that you bring with you so that they can send an official transcript from the school to CASPA and standing in line at each school and doing that, you know, and spending your days kind of trying to piece together your application, um, staying on top of um, letters of recommendation is also a big thing. Um, luckily, um, I worked at, you know, at a hospital in an emergency room where uh, a lot of the doctors and PAs were very familiar with writing these. Um, so it helped a lot. But I know that there were times where I'd have to send, you know, a couple of emails. There's a, of course, a reminder that you can set a deadline for your person, but that deadline isn't always met by the person. So it's trying to do that and. Probably the most important thing, and I mean the most important thing, is your essay. And yeah. your essay is something that you could literally start writing right now, <laughs> but a lot of people don't. Yeah. <laughs> and, or if they do, they'll write it and then wait a while to have someone edit it. And then once they realize that it doesn't look maybe the way it should, then they're coming up to the wire and um, it, it it's one of those things that's the most crucial portion of it, especially with a low GPA is explaining, you know, your situation in that essay. And that's, that was hard to navigate. I mean, the other, I think the other couple of things that were very hard was trying to maneuver through what schools required what certain prerequisites and that's been a huge thing that i've seen tons of mm -hmm. people comment about and and it's hard i actually before i applied i made an excel spreadsheet and made tabs of each school and wrote what requirements were prereqs for what schools um 
what prereqs would count for multiple schools. Um, and then I even broke it down all the way to what the minimum GPA requirement was for schools as well as science GPA. Mm -hmm. And then when you weed through all of the websites for the schools, there's usually a description of what a prospective candidate would be, as in what is the median GPA of the class? What is the median science GPA? And so all of that information kind of helped because it made a blueprint of what schools will I look better at? What schools might I not look as good at? But it still gave me an opportunity to, you know, decide which ones to apply to. And yeah. that, that was, that was probably the biggest thing. And also they don't tell you how much money it costs to apply to each school. And they, the CASPA does describe it. They tell you, I think the first school is, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's $150 for the first or $160. I think it's for the 175 now. Okay. Most so it's 175 and then I think it's 55 for each school after. The unfortunate thing is most of these schools now have supplemental applications yes. attached to that, which will be another 25 to 100, yeah. depending on your school. And then the other thing they don't tell you is each GRE score sent is about $27. So, all of that information is just, it just comes from you doing it. And that's what was so hard about Casper. Like I know the, I know the site is made to be easy, but it has a lot of moving parts, a yeah. lot. It's true. And I'm, I'm sure you get a lot of emails about it. I do. I'm, I'm kind of working on something to try to fix that, but um, not the email part, but to make it easier. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, all right. How many schools did you end up choosing to apply to? Um, I applied to four. Okay. Um, I actually applied to four. Um, I got one interview and one acceptance. <laughs> okay, and then you are good to go. It only takes only yeah. takes one. In the words of Lori. Only takes day. one. And <laughs> I I feel like the groundwork that I had laid um, was the re well, it might possibly be a reason why I got an interview. Um, my aunt and uncle, like I said. Uh, they live in North Bend uh, in Washington. Um, I say my aunt and uncle. Uh, my best friend that I grew up with from the time I was very young, it is actually his aunt and uncle, and they are they are my family. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I stay with them all the time. We have a key to their house. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, they they are they are legitimately family. And on one of the visits, I you know decided. I want to go up to the school. I want to talk to someone and I want to bring my, you know, uh, transcript. And if they'll look it over with me, awesome. And the fact that I emailed someone in the program during application cycle, mind you, and they were willing to sit down with me for 30 minutes was it. I was very impressed by that. And I, I was very, very happy that she sat down with me because this was at the point where I was very hyped up. I think this was probably my sophomore year of college and I was very hyped up and I very much wanted to pursue this, but I wanted to sit down with her and, and say, look, I know my, is this, am I, is this worth it? You know, like, am I going to be able to do this? Or is this something that is a lost cause? Cause I've heard so many people that are like so down on themselves about it. And I was one of those. And so I sat down with her and she said, you know, your GPA in the past was not great. She was like, but the last hours that you've done have been pretty incredible. She's like, you know, these are multiple semesters that you've maintained, you know, this workload with working and that's a huge deal. She's like, you just need to keep going. And she's like, obviously you're not ready yet because you haven't graduated and you're not close yet, but she was like, you need to keep doing this. And walking, walking in into the office, you know, that was, you know, that was kind of something I knew that they were probably going to say. And that, that program specifically, um, when you walk into their office, um, there's a waiting area and in the waiting area, there is a picture of every single class that has graduated from every single site because they have four campus sites mm -hmm. that they run. 
So to sit in that room and look at like that many physician assistants that have come through that program, I, I mean, I, I, I knew I wanted to go there. I knew that was like my top school and I, I'm really glad it worked out because I, I mean, I just, I felt, I felt great when I was there. So that's, and it made me feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, medic. So first of all, it's a very, um, highly sought after program. I think it's, um, got a great reputation and there aren't that many schools in that area. And so, um, it is one that I see on a lot of people's lists that they're looking for. It's, um, Um, it's the second program ever in the country. All right. So right up there with Duke. (laughs) Right. And it was funny because during the interview, um, all of the instructors that are there to do interviews, um, they're all MedEx alum. Yeah. Uh, except for one. And she was from Duke. And uh. so it was funny because when they introduced themselves and basically said where they're from, and when she introduced herself, there were, there were a couple of the faculty that were kind of whispering. They... They, they like to give her a hard time. Yeah, the Duke, the Duke person. Um, right. Well, yeah, but a lot of people want to go there. And um, they are unique in that they will kind of evaluate you. And they'll do that over email, too. And so they, yes. if you send them your information, they will look at it and kind of give you some feedback about what they think you mm-hmm. should work on, which is really, really cool and not something that a lot of programs will take the time to do. Um so that, one, that's cool. One um, one interview that you had on the podcast, mm-hmm. being a fan of it as I was, <laughs> um, I believe it was uh, episode 32. Is that Hannah? I think it was. Um, she, I think, went to USC and said the same thing. Yes. That the, that the mm-hmm. program actually was willing to talk to her and tell her things before. And I feel like, like as a, as a prospective applicant, you'll know what fits. Like even talking to, you know, people on the phone or making a cold call to a program. I mean, you, you can kind of get a feel of what might work for you or what might, you know, feel right. And if, if they're willing to talk to you about, yourself or you know it, it it makes a difference i mean it made a difference for me it made me feel better you know it made me feel like i was you know not just you know out there alone like i i could actually do it you know yeah it gave me it gave me you know drive to keep pushing and you know make sure you're on the right track you know right right um, yeah that's awesome well and so you have just a few months now until school starts right yeah. uh actually march 1st <laughs> okay so are you doing march anything 1st. to prepare or so, what's that yeah. look like so our our program's a little different and i think i've heard that some of them do the same thing but um ours starts online mm-hmm. march 1st um we think we do a 15 week uh, um it's kind of just like an intense like online situation um and then we have a small break and all of the students have to be together on campus july 1st so there'll be a small window of time to move um so that'll be that'll be good um to prepare um i actually reached out to my professor um who taught our cadaver anatomy lab. I was lucky enough to take cadaver anatomy in undergrad, which is not very common. Mm-hmm. And so, cause ca- cadavers can be pretty expensive for a school to take on. And um, so I reached out to her and asked her, cause she had also taught my physiology class. And I just asked if there was any materials that, you know, she thought I should look over because she actually also teaches oddly enough, um, at the, um, campus here in my hometown where there's also a PA program and an OT program and a PT program. 
And so she sent me a bunch of uh, videos and I still had some of my PowerPoints that were left from Cadaver Anatomy. And so I've been trying to comb over that and re refresh myself with <laughs> tons of information. So yeah, you'll be fine. I'm sure I, I always hear though that people will say I studied really hard and then you know, you get there and it's just so much different than what you thought it was going to be. And so, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping. That... <laughs> yeah, I would echo that, that sentiment there. Hope, I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that turns out to be, you know, at least some of what I'm looking at is, you know, relevant, useful yeah. because a lot of people, and I've heard you say it before and other people say it before, maybe study a little bit, but also spend time with your family and friends because that will not exist once, yeah. you know, yeah. so yeah. It's, it's tough to find a balance, but um, it's doable and it goes by very, very quickly. So you'll feel like right. you just, just started and then you'll be done. So right. then you'll be a PA. Um, well, where can everyone kind of find you and follow along? And I'm sure you will get plenty of questions. Right. Uh, I started an Instagram page um, separate from my personal one, um, uh, and it's just basically the PA Ascent. So okay. I'll link to that like for sure. Ascent up the mountain, <laughs> <laughs> which is what this is. And my wife and I climb. So oh, cool. that, that's kind of a, you know, being out in Washington will also, uh, once I have time. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your downtime. Awesome. Well, I'll link to that in the description, and then everyone can go follow you and send you all their questions. And yeah. follow. We'll have to check back in in a couple of years. 